did in Seder Olam. When we calculated the years of the Exodus, remember we wanted to get to the year 1000? We wanted the um, we wanted the Greek year to begin 1000 from the Exodus. Remember what we did? We had a Pusik. It was from Mitzat Mitzrayim from the Exodus until they built the first temple was 480. So 410 years of the first temple period. And then we had seven years in the book of Zechariah. We're going to return to that in a minute. Uh, which is from the time the first temple was destroyed until the second year of Dayavesh. And from the second year of Dayavesh till the end of Tanakh is the 34 years that remained. And then six years later, Alexander the Great comes. So basically, if I follow Seder Olam, and that was necessary to turn the Jewish year, uh, to turn the Greek year into a Jewish year, so that Minyan Shro began a thousand years after the Exodus, then the entire Persian time period is very limited. And from the time the temple was built in year two of Dayavesh, who is our Takshasta, we only have 34 years. And that means, and because Darius is our Takshasta and he's the last Persian king, and six years later, Alexander the Great comes, the story because the Stara must have happened before Darius, but after Koresh. So it's got to be between those 70 years um, after the temple was destroyed, but before the temple was rebuilt. Now we're going to calculate, but now we'll do the calculations that Seder Alam does. Now remember, Seder Alam does not have these dates. Seder Alam doesn't deal with them, doesn't relate to them, and these don't match Seder Alam. But we, we explained that when we did that share earlier. But the outside history doesn't match. I want to show you the logic of, of Seder Alam what happened, and we'll see so many Midrashim that we're all familiar with are based on what Seder Olam did. Now, again, if I follow Seder Olam, there's only one possibility where Akashvirosh could fit, because there's only three Persian kings. The first Persian king is Koresh. He has to be the first one. Daryabesh is our touch, has to be the last one. Akashvirosh must be the middle one. But the question is, can he fit? So to do that, we have to take what's called two sets of 70 years. Do we have a um, second? I hope I have this thing here. Okay. Um, we're going to have two sets of 70 years from two different Naveen. Let me take my, um, stop my screen share for a minute. What confuses many people, and this is what I want to clarify before we get into the details of it. Everyone is almost everyone, at least everyone in our class has heard of the 70 years of exile between the first temple period and the second temple period. Um, the popular understanding is it's seven years of exile or seven years of destruction and they sort of um, conflate the two. When you look carefully, there's two different sets of 70 years. One is a prediction by Yirmiyahu. The other is a statement of fact by the Nabi Zechariah. I want to begin with what we saw in Zechariah because that's our anchor. And that's what we had in Seder Olam. And then we'll go back and see Yermio. If I go back to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah begins in the second year of Daryavesh. Here we are. Where's good old Zechariah? Here's Zechariah. Zechariah chapter one is the eighth month in the year, second year of Daryavesh. King Darius year two. He has his Nebuah. And this one takes place on the 24th day of the 11th month in the second year of Dayavesh. He has a vision and he sees these uh, horses, red horses without going into the details. It's interesting though, that these horses are standing between Hadassim. Some people want to say that maybe Esther's name might relate to these Hadassim, but it might be, but I'm not sure how, how that's not critical for, for following our approach. He has a vision and he wants to understand what's the meaning of the vision. What is the Malach answer? Bayan Malach Hashem Bayomar, Hashem Tzvot, Ad Matai Ata Lot Rachem Et Yerushalayim Et Arei Yehuda Asher Zam Tezeh Shivim Shana. In year two of Dayavesh, there's this angel of God or messenger of God in Zechariah's dream, who's checking out Jerusalem. What's going on? They just broke ground on the temple. Remember, um, in the month of Kislev, in the ninth month of the second year of Dayavesh, they just broken ground. They're just getting started. They're praying that this building project will get off the ground because 18 years ago, we'll see, in the time of Koresh, it didn't get off the ground. They're starting up again and they're hoping maybe this time God will have mercy on them and this time the temple will finally get off the ground. And therefore they're asking, there's a prayer here to God 
maybe will you now have mercy on Jerusalem? Your anger has been against it for the last 70 years, which implies that the temple has been destroyed for 70 years. And the Malach gives him a good answer and says, don't worry, I'm zealous now to fix up Yerushalayim. And therefore, the famous line, what does God say in Pasuk Tetzai, Nechein Ko'amar Hashem, Shaftu Yerushalayim Barachamim B'ti Ibaneva. We quote this in Shemun Esrei, Yerushalayim Yerushalayim Barachamim Tashuv, it's based on this Pasuk. We're asking God to return Yerushalayim like he promised. God's saying, I'm bringing my Shechina back to Yerushalayim in mercy. B'ti Ibaneva, the house will be rebuilt, God says, and we'll start all the building projects. And it'll be, what do you call it? The city will expand and things will be great. And once again, God will have mercy uh, and choose again Jerusalem to be our capital city and have his temple there. Now, based on that verse, we know that it's 70 years from the time of the destruction until the time of, um, from the time of the first temple being destroyed until they break ground on the second temple near two of Daryadesh. Now, if I translate that into years in Tanakh, that's going to be 70 years of I mean, um, from the 11th year of Tzitkiel, we'll see this soon, to the second year of Dayavesh. If I talk about Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu had a different set of 70 years. Yirmiyahu in chapter 25, we saw all this before. Where's Yirmiyahu? In chapter 25 of Yirmiyahu, just to review the first line, this is what happens in the fourth year in the fourth year of King Hoyakim, which is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. Why is there a double date in the beginning of this chapter? Because he gives all this warning and he tells him, because you haven't been listening to me for the last 23 years, I'm going to come and bring Nebuchadnezzar, Yimriel says, and bring him on this land. And then he says as follows, Pasuk Aleph, on the whole Middle East, God saying, and through Yermiel, that Babel is going to be sovereign over the Middle East for the next 70 years. And then, when those 70 years are over, I'm going to punish Melech Babel for all the things he did wrong, and they'll be punished, they'll be taken over by somebody else. Therefore, Yermiel's 70 years begin in the fourth year of Yehoiakim, and they end with the first year of Koresh. I hope that's clear. Let me just review that real fast. I have two sets of seven years that overlap, but they're not identical. There's 70 years of Babylonian rule that begin in year four of Yoyakim and end in the first year of Koresh. I have seven years of destruction, which begins in the 11th year of Tzitkiel and ends in the second year of Koresh. Now, now I need to figure out what's the overlap between those years, but it's really easy to calculate. All you need to do, uh, we have a little table here that clarifies it. But again, Yermiel 70 years, we just read. From year four of Yoakim to year one of Koresh. Tzchayas are from year 11 of Tzitkiel to year two of Dayavesh. Now let's go to good old Tanakh and see how they overlap. So look at, the, look at this little table here. On the left side, let me get a little uh, marker here. On this side over here, these are the these are the years of Babylonian rule. In other words, this is chapter 25 in Yermiel. The first year of Babylonian rule is when Nebuchadnezzar reigns, which is the fourth year of Yehoiakim. The 70th year of Babylonian rule is the Cyrus Declaration, the first year of Korash, that's yes. Ezra chapter 1. What happens in between? Now we just need the book of Malachim. We know that Yehoiakim reigned for 11 years. I mean, Yehoiakim reigned for 11 years. His son Yehoiachim took over for three months and then um, surrendered and went into exile. So Galut Yehoiachim, also known as Galut Yehoniah, happens in the 11th year of Yehoiachim, or basically seven years after Nebuchadnezzar comes into reign. But the temple is not destroyed yet. Instead, the king of Babel appoints a vassal king, Tzitkiel, who reigns for 11 years. And even though Nebuchadnezzar took over the city, in the 11th year of Yehoiakim, the temple remains standing for another 11 years. In the middle of Tzitkiel's reign, in the fifth year of his reign, he decides to rebel against the Babylonians. They're successful for a couple of years. In the ninth year of Tzitkiel, on the 10th of Tebet, they put the Babylonians return and put a siege on the city. In the 11th year of Tzitkiel, as we all know, on Tisha B'av, or on the 10th of Av, or the 7th of Av, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians by Nebuchadnezzar. 
And that's year, but it's year 18 into the seven years of Babylonian rule. Now, but that year is the first year, right? That year um, of 11th of Tzidkiel is the first year of the 70 years of, of Zechariah. So how do you get to Zechariah 70 years? What do we have? Um, from We have the Cyrus Declaration in year 70. And then because there's 18 years um, from the beginning of Yermio, seven years until the, Come time on. Is, until the beginning, there's, there's an 18 year overlap from the time Yermio, seven years begin until Zechariah, seven years begin. And there's 18 years in the beginning, there's 18 years in the end. And therefore, from the set, from the first year of Cyrus, from the first Persian king, the first year of Koresh, there's 18 years until the second year of Dayavesh. Okay? Now, what did Chazal do? Within these 18 years, I need to fit all this, all the events of Megillah Tester. Let me make that clear again. I have 18 years here between this and this, between these two events, between the Cyrus Declaration and year two of the Yevish when they break ground on the temple. I can only have 18 years by definition if I follow Tanakh, if I only have Tanakh. I have at least 14 years of Achashverosh. Can it fit? Well, we'll see it's going to fit perfect. Why? Tanakh never tells us how many years Cyrus was king for. Outside history tells us he reigned for another nine years. But Tanakh doesn't have that. On the other hand, if you open up your Tanakh in the book of Daniel, we're going to find that Daniel has a vision. I'm pretty sure it's chapter 10 or 11. We'll find it in a minute. Daniel is over. Here we go. We'll try with chapter 10, and then we'll switch. Yeah, chapter 10. Bishnat shalosh l'koresh melech paras, tabar niglal Daniel. Okay. Daniel has a vision in the third year of Koresh. It doesn't say that Koresh died that year, but I know from chapter 10 in Daniel, and this is chronologically the last uh, event in Daniel. It's not the last chapter, but the last event in historical order. We know from here that Koresh was king for at least three years because Daniel had a vision in the third year of Koresh. Did he live longer? We don't know. But he was alive at least three years. So I have at least three years of Koresh. Okay? And we ha- and we know Haggai builds the temple in the second year of Dayavish. So let's go back and see what we're left with. Actually, it's real easy. There's at least three years of Koresh. So what, what's said Roland say? Koresh was king for three years and that's it. And then Achishverosh reigns in the third year of Koresh. Now, in the second year of Dayavesh, already uh, they're building the temple, which means Darius became king in year 87, which leaves exactly 14 years for Achashverosh. Understand? From 73 to 87, there's only 14 years that Achashverosh can fit in. And it's almost like a perfect match. And basically, what, what, what conclusion does Sedra Lam reach? That the 14 years that we find in the book of Megillat Esther, is exactly the gap between Korosh and Daryavish. Korosh had to be king for, for these three years. So what happened? That's the year he died. And then the next year, Achashverosh takes over. He's the king in between. He's king for 14 years. The year that Achash, the year that Miguel Tester ends, Achashverosh suddenly dies. And his son Darius takes over. And the next year, we're already building the second temple. What did we gain by that? There's a famous medrash, I'm sure you all heard. Why is it that Darius allows the Jews to build the temple? Well, if Darius is the king after Achashverosh, Darius is the son of Achashverosh, and Esther is his mommy. And therefore, but if you do the calculation, he couldn't have been more than six or seven years old at the time. And, and therefore, why does Darius, why does Dayevish allow the Jews to build the temple? Because he's Esther's son. And he's really not running the country. He's only six years old. Who's really running the country? Mordechai and Esther. And then, um, if we do this, every single year is accounted for. We have the three years of Koresh. Fits perfect with the book of Daniel. We have the 14 years of Achashverosh in between. Fits perfect with the book of Esther. And then, we have the second year of Dayavesh. And then, because there's no gap between the sixth year of Dayavesh and the seventh year of Achashasa, because they're the same king, then every single year is accounted for in Seder Olam. And that's, remember, we go back to what we saw before. Uh, let's 
go back to our mouse and clear this. That was exactly the 70 years of, that was exactly, we put everything in these 70 years and that's how we got to the year 1000. So if I want to just summarize my conclusion, if I want to understand what Chazal did with Megillat Esther, it's nice and simple in Seder Olam. There's nowhere else to put Achashverosh other than between Koresh and Dayabesh. I can't put it anywhere else. And it exactly fits. He, like he squeezes right in and there's nothing else. Once I have that, now we go back to the Megillah and look at all the different events. What do we find? Well, we know if I go through the events of Megillah Tester, the Megillah Tester begins in year three. Remember, B'Shat Shlosh Lamachol, he makes a Mishteh. What's happening in year three of King Achashverosh? Let's see. If he becomes king in year 73, in year 76 is a big party. Right. Now, year 76 is what? Is 76 years since Nebuchadnezzar's reign, but it's 69 years. Where are we? Okay. It's 69 years from when? From Galut Yohayachin. Now, if you want to, right, that's a big party. Got it? From year 7 to 76. It's 69 years from, from the first wave of exile of Yohayachin. So, what do the rabbis say in Seder Olam? Why is Achashverosh making a party? Because he miscalculated Yimriel's 70 years. He thought 70 years has passed, it was only 69. He was off by a year, you know, he made a mistake in his math. But he thought you know, seven years are over and they're so happy the Jews didn't return and there's no return to the temple. And he takes out the Kedim and the Beit HaMikdash and they're celebrating the fact that Jews have not rebuilt the temple. I'm sure you're familiar with that Midrash. Is that shot in the Megillah of Persian history? Of course not. But what are the rabbis doing? Everywhere possible in the Midrash, they're bringing the Beit HaMikdash into the story. Now, um, Okay, let me, I have only a couple of minutes left, so let me finish this up and then I'll take questions. Um, but uh, the, the two, let me go over the two or three key points that everyone learned uh, when you learn classic Jewish history in Seder Olam when you study Megillah Tester. When you study Megillah Tester, everyone puts Achashverosh after Koresh. And hence, Achashverosh is the father of Daryavesh, of Darius, who allows the Jews to rebuild the temple. And the reason for the party is because Yimriel's seven years are over. And the base of Mikdash isn't rebuilt. Um, and the Kedim at the Beit HaMikdash, the Kedim at the party of the Kedim at the Beit HaMikdash. Now, the question is when the rabbis say those things, are they telling you what they think is historically true? Are they doing the same thing that the Megillah is doing? Because if I look at real history and outside history, what do I know? If I look at the real history, let's go here. Um, there's a real history. I'm sorry. You were up here. If I look at the real history, Achashverosh is where exactly in the gap between Daryavish and Achashverosh. From a prophetic point of view, in, after, this, after the sixth year of Daryavish, the temple was built. And this was the big gap we talked about between the sixth year of Daryavish and the seventh year of Atakshasta, the big gap in the book of Ezra. There's not, there's, it's all hush. We don't know, we don't know what happened then. But if I follow outside history, some how many years passed by? Um, some from here to here, from 520, from 518 till 465. Some 40, 50 years passed by, and nothing happened. If you remember what we read in Zechariah, which we'll have to see next week. In Zechariah, um, in the fourth year, when the people ask, do we continue fasting? God says, I'm returning my people. The Shekhinah is going to return. Zechariah talked about the Shekhinah returning. Fast days turning into holidays, no need to fast anymore, and things like that. Everyone was hoping that this would be the final redemption, the Jews would return, and the temple would be rebuilt, and things would be great. If the story of Miguel Atesar is happening in the very um, immediately after the reign of Darius, some 15, 20 years after the temple was built already, and Amisar didn't answer the call, then I might have a reason why God's angry with his people. You know what it would be like? Assuming that God wants, if I follow the biggest theme of Tanakh, and especially following Zechariah, I mean following Yirmiyahu's hope, when Yirmiyahu's seven years are over, Am Yisrael has a chance to return to its land, rebuild the temple, and become God's people again. If they don't answer that call, wouldn't God be really upset? God gives with the, the Cyrus Declaration, 
we have this great opportunity to return to become God's people. We know that only a small number, a small portion of the people return. Most of the people are still in the Persian Empire. If you were God, wouldn't you be upset? Would there be any reason to keep just your connection to your people? And I want to read two psukim or three in Miguel Atester that might be alluding to that. Because remember, we don't have God's name, but the, the, the main, the biggest word in Megillah is the word Melech, isn't it? Every column begins with the word Melech. And there's a question whether who's the Melech of Ahasuerus, who's, who's, who's the king of the book. And if you remember the first line that, um, sorry, not this one. If you remember the first time that Haman himself is quoted, I keep on getting the wrong share. The first time that we quote Haman is the beginning of chapter three. Here we go here. Um, what does Haman say? I'm sorry. Remember, there's one nation. Um, I will get to this one in a minute. Remember, Haman says there's a nation. Again, wrong share. I'll get it straight one day. Here we go. We're going to open the Tanakh. Here we are. Book of Esther in chapter three. And I think verse eight in chapter three. The opening words of Haman to Esther. I mean, there's a nation scattered among the different nations in the entire Persian Empire. Their laws are different. They're not following the laws of their king. And it's not worth for the king to keep them around. Now, of course, Haman's referring to Ahasuerus and the Jews not following Ahasuerus. But could this be alluding to the fact that that the king is God and the Jewish people aren't following their God. If I want to go back a story, you know what it'd be like? You can compare this to the following story. Let's say there's a king, a great king, who is celebrating how great he is. He wants, he thinks he's, he's like the real king of all kings. He's making a big party to celebrate his, um, his coronation or how great he is. And let's say he's married to a trophy wife. She used to be a model, but she, what do you call it? He was like the prettiest, super pretty. And he calls his wife to come to the inauguration ball. And imagine if she says, you know what? I don't want to come because I don't like your pot. Like if she refused to come, wouldn't the king be really angry? That was, he, he wants to show off his trophy wife to everyone around and she doesn't want to show. Now, isn't that really similar to the first story of Miguel Atester? Which is a really, that's a, one of the big questions. What's that story doing in the beginning of the Megillah? Remember, first we talked about um, you know, this party in Shushan of Iran, the Kidim Kidim Shonim. Now, everyone knows that the king called for Vashi to come, and Vashi doesn't come. Remember this guy, Mamukhan? Okay. What does Mamukhan say about Vashti? Um, Vashti sin, not coming to show her beauty. To all the nations to honor Ahasuerus. Remember, if if the king calling his wife to show her beauty to make himself look great among the nations, if we take the analogy to God, who wants His glory to be known, if He chose if He chose the Jewish people to sanctify God among the nations to show God's beauty, and that's why God wants His temple and His people back in His land, then this would be a terrible precedent. Okay? This was not only a transgression against the king. This is a transgression against everyone, all civilization. Because what will happen? Because word will get out that what? That everyone, um, they take it really too far, that can believe it, that women might um, start embarrassing their husbands in public. You can imagine what kind of disaster that would be. And therefore, he sends the strangest edict afterwards because of what Vashti did. He sends for him to all the king, all the lands of the all the states in the kingdom. Okay. They're called Adam Kush and every nation based on their thing. Every nation has to be in its land, in its home, and speak its own language. Now, that's the question. Is this just part of the story? Or is this, if you use the, the analogy back to Animal Farm, is the um is that is the Navi is the Megillah up to something else? Now, if if I want to make my assumption that the author of Megillah Tester is assuming his reader knows that the Jewish people did not answer their call and didn't return, 
The question is, is the way the story is being told, is it being told in a way so that the reader, oh my gosh, maybe it's me. I'll, I'll give you a really bad example. Remember King David did that terrible sin with uh, Bathsheba? So Natana Navi doesn't come and tell um, King David, oh, you did a terrible thing. What's he do? He makes up a story. Remember about the, uh, you know, the guy who steals the, the, uh, the poor man's lamb, you know, the rich guy. Who and then only after the story, ah, that's you. I, sometimes through an analogy, sometimes when you give Musser in an indirect way, sometimes it's much more powerful. Again, we'll never know for sure if that's true, or it could be that's just what happened. But my point is, if I take into consideration um, the time period, the theme, not just of Chumash, the theme of the entire Tanakh, especially the theme that we've been discussing for our 14, 15 classes so far, of what I call from Cyrus to, um, from what's that, from King Cyrus to what for, if I'm assuming that God wants his people to return to their land, and they don't, and that's a very good reason to, for God to be upset, the question is, do I have a reason why God is upset with his people? And now he does not begin to tell us about how God saves his people. It might be also alluding to the fact of why God almost destroyed his people. Then the question is going to come up, if we deserve being destroyed, why does why don't we get destroyed? So that would do in our next year when we talk about Shira Tazino. Remember the name Esther Banochi, that's what's called the idea of Hester Panim. And what I'm going to do in the next year, we're going to take a whole bunch of um, if you download the source sheet, you'll see them, lots of sources from Sharia. We're going to show you numerous places in the Megillah that might be alluding to all the things we saw in the book of Ezra, in the book of Sharia, in the book of Haggai, etc. of um, of what's going on. Now, this is something, once something's written, um, not explicit, but only implicit, there's no way I can prove it only through circumstantial evidence. And that's the question whether um, the authors were writing something satirical. Now, we're not questioning the authenticity of the story. Whether the story happened or not, it's not really important. Um, something must have happened. The question is how the story is being written. Because the story is written in a, like a fairy tale style. I hardly doubt that every single detail is, in, is a a very, what do you call it, exact historical um, recording of the events. But the author is writing it to give a message to his people. And the question is, is, is the book of Esther giving Musser to the Jewish people for not returning to rebuild the temple? And then everyone will decide on their own. Uh, but that's like the big argument in modern day scholarship also. Uh, Aaron Collar taught, he's given classes here before, right? So Aaron Collar is the... Uh, Although not on Purim. He hasn't taught on yeah, Purim, but yes. Yeah, yeah. He champions the idea that it's only about the Jews in exile. It's got nothing to do with Israel and Jerusalem. And Yoni Grossman know, has a whole book I know on, um, um, Avi Walfish gave a talk a number of years ago, I think, for Term Motion, where he took the, you know, it's a huge critique on the um, on the Jewish community in the exile. And it, it carries over into the Mishnah, the first Mishnah and the second Megillah, the five days to read the Megillah, whatever he had a whole sheer on... That. That's the other yeah. side, but okay, you go on. Okay, so that was the thing. Let me look at the chat real fast. That's not, not too big this time. One second. Chat is here. Um, yeah, Seder Olam is Midrashic for sure. Yeah, we, 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 we talked Seder Olam, and we said that Seder Olam is Midrashic, and the question is when Seder Olam gives a history, are they telling you what they thought was history, or they know that's not real history, but it's part of Seder Olam, but they're embellishing the history. Once, once I need to get the year 1000, it just it works out great with Miguel Atis there. Uh, later, why, why Jewish history and why like rabbinic tradition has accepted Seder Olam as real history, then hopefully we'll have time to talk about in the next class. Um, um, no, I'm not sure whether, whether Persians, um, by the way, the Persians and the Jews got along great together, only like recently. With, uh, with the extremists taking over. But before Khomeini took over, Israel and Persia were, got along great with each other. They were like buddy buddies. We have a long history getting, and during uh, Babylonian times, you know, during the time of the Golanim, Jews in Babylonia were, um, you know, thrived under under Persian rule. So what I'm saying, wasn't, um, I piece these Darius, is, yeah, no, Darius, that's right. The actual, Darius's real father was somebody else, for sure. Definitely wasn't, um, wasn't Achashverosh, even in outside histories, not Achashverosh. He's coming from a, a totally different lineage. Again, what I'm trying to say is the classic Seder Olam history doesn't fit with Tanakh and it doesn't fit with outside history at all. But when you read it, when you teach it simplistically, 
Now, the, the problem with it, it works so perfectly. You follow? The years just match up exactly. It's just squeeze in perfectly. And it matches. I have a reason for the party. It's called Tziba Lam Tziba. And I have a reason for why Darius allows the Jews to build the temple. And it fits so nicely. You know, why ruin it? It's got such a nice, simple explanation. Plus, you get to the Greek year being the Jewish, Jewish year of a thousand years. And it just became so accepted. That was, we're working backwards. Once I accept Seder Olam, remember I told you the Jewish state, 5781, is built on Seder Olam? So once I write that date on every Jewish document, right? On Aksuba and everything, and on Tum, that then all the Midrashim that fit Seder Olam become Jewish history. Because if I say Achashverosh is later on, then there goes 5781. So almost by default, once I accept the years 5781, I have to accept Seder Olam is historically true. And if historic if Seder Olam is historically true, then then, there, then Seder Olam's explanation Begilat Esther becomes Jewish history. And that's in all the Jewish history books that's how it's written. So almost every every Arsenal Jewish history book, even you know, in the Talmud, it goes that way. You know, it's, everyone accepts this as given history. I'm trying to explain how it came about that it became history, even though it was only Midrashic interpretation. Uh, but because the Midrashic interpretation is so good and it fits so nicely, it just got accepted widely. And until we started getting to archaeology and outside history and documents and study and things like that, then um, we can uncover the, the deeper meaning of the book. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, okay, thank thing? you. I think next, week, next week, next week's the fun part where I go through the McGill and show you. We'll see Zaharia coming through the, through the, uh, through the, uh, what do you call it? Through the woodwork, I think it's called. We'll, we'll, we'll see a lot of Sukim that if it wasn't, if this theory is not true, the, the Sukim simply don't make sense. If this theory is true, then Sukim make a lot of sense. Okay, see, people the, commenting a little on your history thing, I think we can pick up on that next week. Probably, uh, we, we have a different view of history today. And for sure, I'm sure many of these people thought it was real history. We may know it's Midrashic history, but that doesn't mean that people yeah. saying it thought that. They may have thought it was real history. Yeah, but why wouldn't they think that? Because they don't have all the other sources. Right. Today, it's a little bit uh, different. Yeah, it's, it's a big topic. This. Uh, no, if, if, if you grow up and the only source you have is Seder Olam, there's, I'm, my point when I did the Seder Olam share was that Seder Olam knew the real history, but made up the Midrashic history for its, Midrashic, for its, um, for its thematic purpose. You know, to make the Jewish year, uh, the Greek year, Jewish year. And therefore, it, it, it uses Midrashic interpretation to, to fit, make sure the years fit. But because it works so nicely, and because later on that became the accepted Jewish year, then all those Midrashim de facto became Jewish history because people weren't aware of the real history. And then uh, that became the real, um, it, it makes sense what happened. How many people in medieval times had Josephus and and they had um, what do you call it? Um, all the Babylonian uh, uh, the, the Greek histories and the Babylonian histories and the Persian histories and the archaeology and the astronomical data that wasn't available to anybody. So why wouldn't you take Seder Olam literally? It works so nice. That's, it just, I don't know. It's just too good to be true. Rabbi, have we spoken about? I forget if we spoke about you know, Rabbi Schwab's article about this whole thing with the destruction of the temple. That you know how when you've alluded to it, how Chazal. The purposely, um, you know, his, his point the was that they make him take it back that they purposely hid the year so when Mashiach comes, we'll be caught by surprise. Right, but Rabbi yeah. Schwab said now that it's been revealed that what the true history is, we have to teach the true history. We can no longer teach as yeah. history, the quote unquote, the Midrashic history, as you like to put it. So uh, okay. that's um, he wrote an article many years ago. I, I don't uh, know where to have the link it is offhand, but Rabbi Schwab, the head of the uh, Boris community in Washington Heights. That about his history. sort of understanding of history. I'm it, sorry? That, that's, already, that's already an educational question about, like about how you, what you teach well. people and how you teach it. So that's an educational dilemma. What, you bring this up when you teach this to kids because all day come out, oh, the rabbis are wrong. If the rabbi right. are wrong about history, they're wrong about halacha and I can pick and choose. Right, so we've discussed this already a few times, but yes, but it's yeah. important. That's, I think, why he was pointing it out. There was a reason for Kazal to do it. But to, to, to continue with that in the light of, you know, archaeology and historical evidence would be a huge mistake. Okay? I think it was giving an educational idea. Anyway, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We look forward to next week. Just be, uh, 